Um, yeah, so I'm going to do uh, just a, a short presentation on field selection and landing safety in cross country. As I was saying before Andy, Andrew did his um, uh, introduction, uh, I, I, I love cross country flying and I, uh, and, and I used to be quite intimidated by uh, flying and having to land in fields and stuff like that. But <laughs> considering some of the crap fields I've landed in, I, I'm no longer intimidated. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's become something that's, that's quite normal. So what I'm going to do is, obviously, the picture you see there on the screen is a picture of when I was landing uh, in a field after doing some wave soaring out of uh, Cyford a couple of years ago, but I, I've got a bit of video to show that a bit better later. Um, so we'll, we'll come to that. Now, let me just work this out. Yeah, okay, so the agenda we're gonna look at, we're gonna, obviously Andrew's already done how to use uh, Zoom. I'm gonna look at errors and common misunderstandings, uh, decision heights and some useful tips. I'm looking slightly to my right because I've got two screens. I've got the screen in front where I can see all you. So I prefer to look at my main screen so I don't have to look at you. Uh, um, but I've got, uh, so I'm looking slightly to my right. It's got field selection itself, circuit, because that's really important. What if it goes wrong and what to do once you have landed? So, so I'll start. Uh, common, common errors and common misunderstandings. I, I think landing in a field is fairly routine and the more you sort of see it as routine, the, the more fun it becomes. It, it's not particularly scary. It's, uh, uh, I, I think the first two were a bit intimidating. I mean, I can, uh, Chris um, Gill was running uh, something on Facebook uh, today, which was basically, you know, what was an emergency situation. I remember my first ever field landing when I was flying out of Saltby, Saltby in a K6. Uh, when I decided quite cleverly I would um, outsoar a, a QNIM and, and halfway around the QNIM it started to snow and strangely enough the snow the wind is always coming towards you when it's snowing and as I missed the first field and hopped over the hedge at the end and landed in the next field I can tell you that was a most unplanned um, uh, field landing my first ever uh, but it was looking back scary. It was scary at the time, but actually if I'd done it all properly and not been such an arse, it would have been great. Um, so that was very much a late decision uh, and late decisions are bad decisions. And quite frankly, the only reason I got away with it was because there was a field the other end of the hedge that I jumped over. If there'd been a wood there or a, a forest, <laughs> I'd have been picking my teeth out of a load of trees. But so if you do it, if you do it well, you know, field landings as, as normal as, and, and as sh should be as normal as when we're landing at, at, at Cyford or anywhere. So you, you will succeed if you fly, fly a proper circuit. And the sort of questions that you can ask yourself is, how far can you see from 2000 feet? So that's a question to everybody really. Uh, you've got the chat uh, and they see if there's some answers come back. Um, so how far can you see from 2000 feet, everybody? in distance terms. We've got three miles, 10 miles from Peter Gill. From, from 2,000 feet, you can see, not how far you can get to, you can see 47.6 kilometers on a very clear day. You can see, so you can see in one direction 47, and you can see in another direction 47 kilometers. Okay, it's gonna chop and change. But how far can you see from 200 feet? Actually, if you were stat, sat on the top of a hill at 200 feet, um, you, you, can, you can see about 15 kilometers on a clear, clear, perfect day. So the only reason I'm asking those questions is because it really should lead you to think, well, if you make a decision at 2000 feet, you've got a lot more to go at than you've got at if you make it at 200 feet. So one of the, 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 this last two questions here is how, how, far, how far can you go to find a better field from 2,000 feet? And the better question is probably how far can 1,000 feet take you in a 30 to 1 glider at glide angle? So th there's a very sort of basic calculation, however good your glider is, that you can do. Um, and in a, basically in a 30 to 1 glide angle, how much height or how far can you go with 1,000 feet? Can anybody 
you you can see the chat, Andrew. So tell me if we get any answers on that. Oh, oh thirty thousand, okay. Peter. Five nautical miles, Phil, Phil Donovan. Ten k, Chris Gill. Ten k, yeah. So from a thousand feet, you can go ten k with a thirty to one glide angle. Um, so when you when you look at it like that. Um, if you're at 2,000 feet, if you're in a crap area, you can get yourself to a good area with 1,000 feet quite, quite straightforwardly. And I, and I think that, that, that's pretty, pretty important. And we'll, we'll, we'll come to that because when it comes to making decisions, and this is where we sort of got decision heights and, and some useful tips. You see that picture on the right and you're getting a bit low or say down to 2,000 feet, just keep on hacking on because that's, that's a good view that you can see there. There's, there's plenty of lift in front of you. You can fly along this street. I don't know whose picture this is. It's one I stole from the, the, the gliding club, but it, this is a really good sky. So one, you shouldn't be too low if you're flying along this street. And two, if you're down to 2000 feet, you can be fairly confident that you're gonna run into another thermal. If you're flying either side of this cloud, maybe not so much. Try to fly in the center here and you'll, you'll, you'll keep confident. So, the way I look at it, the way I view it, when I'm flying cross countries, I don't even bother thinking about landing out particularly um, below 2,000 feet or 2,000 feet above ground level. Uh, about by eye, obviously you can use your, 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 your altimeter as well, but if you think about it, you fly at 2,000 feet, uh, you, you probably, well you should be if you're going cross country, you'd be flying Q&H rather than QFE, so your altimeter is set um, so that you're taking into account where you took off from so you can judge where you are uh, and as long as you know where you are you can roughly see when you're 2,000 feet above ground level um, and actually from 2,000 feet you can cover about 9,000 square miles uh, or you can see over 9,000 square miles which comes back to your sort of 47 kilometers you can see from 2,000 feet okay you can't get to that but you can get to over 400 square kilometers uh, at that stage so you've got you've got you know in terms of your 30 to 1 glide angle so you've got a lot of potential to go a long way so as I say if the sky looks good have confidence you're going to make it work but if you start to get below a couple of thousand feet start to think about where you are start to look at the fields around um, I mean the person who's probably attending this has got the most experience in terms of cross-country flying uh, it's probably Chris Gill. Chris, would you start looking below 2,000 feet or do you keep hacking on? Uh, it depends where I am. If I'm local, I know where the fields are. If I'm uh, cross country, then yeah, 2,000 feet and below, you're looking, but you're also looking for sources of lift. Of course. Yeah. Definitely Absolutely. making sure you're in a vulnerable area within, you know, within easy reach. Yeah, for sure. So once you get down to 1,500 feet, above ground level, you really should be looking for potential fields. I mean, be very aware when you're just below 2000 feet, keep an eye out, make sure you're in a flat area. If you're in a very hilly area, you know, there are plenty of fields in even quite hilly areas and we'll, we'll show you that in, in a minute. But, um, uh, but by 1500 feet, you should really be picking a field, but still being alert for, for lift because your country needs alerts. Um, if it needs to be at that stage, if you've not got any good fields around, then you have to start looking for better fields and better areas. Um, and particularly if you're in a very mountainous area, you don't want to be hacking along at 1500 feet thinking, oh yeah, I'll be all right for a bit longer. You know, be sensible. Um, because it's, to enjoy field landing, you've got to give yourself time. Um, and as I've said there, flying downwind allows you to cover more ground to find fields. So if you're, you know, if you do fly, downwind you will cover more ground your glide angle effectively will be improved by the fact that you're flying downwind so just give yourself time um you know it's all it's always about time uh, and you know the more the less time you give yourself the more overloaded you become uh, and that's obviously not not great but by a thousand feet above ground level again you you've got to view this and uh, you know this is why it's so important to not just use you know bits and pieces around the airfield to judge where you are in time times of height you've got to be able to to judge your height um by 800 feet and if you read the uh, field landings in the bronze sea 
but by 800 feet, you've got to start your circuit. And once you've committed, and this is the big thing that the, the British Gliding Association makes clear to everybody, is that once you have committed to land in a field, do it. I mean, we've all been in situations where we've committed to land and we get a lit, whisper lift if it's a goodie. We've, we've all misbehaved at times and <laughs> kept going. And, uh, but certainly when you're first starting out, um, if you've not done a lot of cross country, just be disciplined. When I first, I landed in a lot of fields. I have landed in a lot of fields, but there's a lot of us that have landed in a lot of fields, but I make a decision. And once I've made the decision to land, and in fact, the piece of video I show you at the end, I made a decision a lot higher than this. One, because I knew I wasn't going to get back and two, it was bloody windy. So uh, I, I decided that's what I was going to do. It was wave soaring rather than, um, uh, rather than thermals. So then that brings you on to, Field, field selection. Um, this mnemonic, which I'm, I'm damned if I could ever remember, um, but uh, this is the uh, Bronze Sea uh, mnemonic for field, field landing. Um, and that's basically what you've got to, uh, what have I done there? Sorry, I've drawn something else onto the screen, apologies. Put that over there. Um, if you look, this, this is lifted straight from uh, the Bronze Sea book. So wind, um, which direction's the wind from? So uh, the way I look at that is that, you know, we know the wind will potentially change throughout the day. We know that. But in general, if you're flying in a wind, in a stream of air in the morning that's from the northwest, you know, you're generally going to know the, the, the synopsis for the day. And, and the way I look at it is that I, I pay attention to the weather forecast. I look at what it's going to be when I take off. I, I've looked at the synoptic chart to understand where I think it's going to come from uh, later on in the day. And in, in general, I know which directions the wind's going to be coming from. But then obviously you've got to understand and know which direction you're going in. The way I look at it, I always have a, a good view of what's north and south and east and west, but I also know that the sun is always in the south and throughout different parts of the day and at different parts of the year, it's always more or less in the south. And I know it's in the morning, it's going to be in the east, in the afternoon, it's going to be in the west. And it's those sorts of things I, I judge that with. I'm also looking at smoke, birds, the trees. If you're low enough, you can see the trees starting to move and stuff like that. So wind, very important. The size of um, the size of a field. Now there's, there's, the bigger the field, the better, but I'd always rather land uphill. Well, that's, that's fundamental. Don't land downhill regardless. Even if the wind is a light wind and it's slightly behind you, you're better off landing uphill than landing, uh, uh downhill with the wind in front of you when you cross country and size wise you need a good size it needs to be longer than it is wider generally um and you need well what does it say in the old bronze book you need to be at least 250 meters from where you round out so you're going to need 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 yourself leave yourself plenty of room the the earlier you make decision in terms of a field the 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 better your choice will be the slope obviously um you don't want to land downhill. That's just a raw, that's just no, no good at all. So if you're looking at a slope, how do you tell what a slope is? If you can really see a slope from the air, it's steep. Okay. So, um, particularly from a couple of thousand feet, but if you look at a river meandering through uh, an area, all the land generally slopes down, uh, to the river. Um, and you know, just so I don't forget anything, anybody, um, Pete or anybody can make comment on how you tell about slope. Anybody else want to point out any other ways of judging that on the chat? Hi, I'm it's Paul. Hi, Paul. Hi there. Yeah, one thing you, you haven't got down to it yet, but I always advocate that uh, a good circuit at a reasonable height means that as you're going downwind and you see that the slope is in the wrong way, you've got the option of doing a 180 and doing the circuit in the other way. Because it's a good the, option, the slope, yeah. you won't find the slope until sometimes you're below a thousand feet. Yeah, for sure. And, and Pete's comment on chat there, I've got it now, Andrew. Um, look at the field from the side. Ab absolutely. Um, I mean, as you're flying round, if you're keeping an eye on the field all the time, you, you will see 
these sorts of things, you'll see which way the, the, the furrows are going, you'll see which way the slope is. Um, the worst thing you can do, and we'll, we'll talk about this, is that if you are too close to the field and the field suddenly disappears behind you in terms of a circuit, then, then, you're, gonna, then you're not going to know what the slope is. So try and keep an eye on things. So, so yeah, good, good, good point, Paul, and, and good one, Peter, as well, for basically looking at the field from the side. So, yeah. Oh, welcome, Pauline. You've made it. Hey, hello, Pauline. You're in there somewhere. It's taken me a while, but we got Pauline on. I'm so happy. Welcome, Pauline. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, so the slope, the surface. Well, OK, in this country, depending on what time, time of year you're going to be uh, flying, um, you're going to be looking for crop. You're going to be looking for uh, plough, whether the, you, you don't want to be landing across furrows on plough because that will break your glider. So you want to land with the furrows. You don't want to be landing in oilseed rape uh, because that's really not very nice. Uh, and we don't want to land in any crop, really. So we want to be careful. So you need to understand what you're doing and you need to understand the sort of crops that are around at the time of year and okay we're very early at the moment this time of year if we were able to fly if we were able to fly that'd be nice wouldn't it um we we'd be going cross country and we wouldn't be worrying too much but by the time you get into june and july early july particularly june and early july your crops are, are beginning to be more um more established um maybe corn or the lot you know or oilseed rape maybe you've gone not so yellow then it's started to break down so just again give yourself time and and understand what the surface surface is um stock uh, we don't really want to land with stock but if there was nothing else um i've landed in fields of stock mostly sheep yeah <laughs> like the sheep <laughs> <laughs> who was that oh it's my daughter making rude remarks um yeah so sheep race horses or horses do not land in fields with horses wherever you are particularly if you're around new market or anything like that our insurance doesn't cover race horses okay so stay away from horses they can be very skittish and very very expensive um you do not want to land near horses anybody else want to make a comment about horses no good um but Thank you. You know, honestly, they all are getting on the act, don't they? <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, sheep. I've landed with a few sheep. Furry friends on a cold day and all that. Peter's made a comment. I landed in a field with horses under a parachute. They run towards you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. The BGA video is for recognised significance, different shades of green, not grey. That's good. It, yeah, horses are okay. It's the owners that cause the problems. Yeah, Andrew, you're a horsey man, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen your Facebook. Uh, yeah, so, and of course, obstructions. So we're looking for telephone lines, very difficult, and, and uh, overhead power cables, very, very difficult to spot from the air. Um, however, if you're flying on a, on a sunny day, or uh, which you inevitably will be if you're flying cross country, you would hope, um, you can you can see the shadows of the pylons or the telegraph poles. They stick out really well. And also, if they're in a plough or a crop, the, the, they tend to be little circles around them sometimes because of the because of the crop. So uh, and and the tractors and stuff that have used that use the field. So uh, quite interesting. So I've got a couple of pictures I want to show. This one, this first one is a, a picture I took. Uh, can everybody see it well enough? Yeah, just wave if you can see it properly. Um, this is, there is actually an airfield down there. Um, uh, this was a flight I did last year uh, down to Talgarth. Uh, and Black Mountains Gliding Club is actually down there. Now, all these fields, you think, well, it's quite a hilly area down there. Um, where the hell is it? Can you see it in the middle there? That is Black Mountains Gliding Club there. So... It's not a very big field, but if you start to compare it with the other fields uh, that are around, um, you start to realise that they're actually doing gliding operations from here and effectively they're landing in this little bit here. So there's other fields as, that are around here that you can see, even though it's quite hilly country, there are other fields that are very landable. So, you know, it, the, coming back to how we started with, with it, you know, in terms of what we're flying and how we're flying and how we're being comfortable in fields. As long as you allow yourself plenty of time. I mean, this picture on the left, 
was taken from about 3,000 feet just above the ridge, three and a half maybe. Um, uh, and this is a close up in the field here, of the field here. So it goes to show there's a lot more available than you think. So you can be a lot more comfortable, but if you're in more difficult terrain, give yourself more time. And this is, uh, Mr. Gill, Mr. Chris Gill will see this one and recognize this probably. Um, this is the field I landed in in January, Chris. Um, trying to wave saw and uh, trying to be too greedy and heading for a bit of lift that I didn't quite get to and should have pushed on to more, but then lost my bottle, turned around and thought, oh, bugger, um, I'll better find a field. Now, this is right up in, the, uh, in North Wales, the nor uh, west of uh, Lake Brennig. So the field that I've landed in here, uh, it's a nice uphill field. Um, there's a hedge here. There, there are sheep in there, but let's be honest, in Wales, uh, I'm not a magician. I can't find many fields without sheep that are landable. Um, this, was, this was the sort of landing run. Um, I was flying my LS7. Um, I didn't actually use any wheel brake at all. So I came in, I came in, it was a windy day. So I came in reasonably quick, um, used the slope, got the speed off fairly quickly, opened the air brakes fully uh, and was quite happy. And this is a view of it in the other direction. You can see my, um, my run here. So I touched down, I touched down about here, uh, sorry, here. And my landing run was quite short. So probably a hundred meters or so, but it was a windy day. I knew I had plenty of, um... <laughs> thank you, Rich Mitchell. Richard has put on chat, W3W, what three words? The area I land in, landed in was uh, designated under what three words as thou, though wrong decisions was the, uh, the what three words location that I landed in. And he's probably, he's not a million miles away from the truth there. So a nice, very enjoyable, um, enjoyable field landing that one, but uh, I would prefer not to have landed in it, if I'm honest. So, I'm not going to, oh, how do I get rid of that annotation? Bear with me. Uh, oh, can I say it? Undo. Okay, sorry. So I, I've just lifted something here from the um, BGA instructor's manual, which is just the standard circuit. And there is no reason why any of us can't do this when you're field landing. You know, it, it's exactly what I was coming back to a minute ago. If you fly a proper circuit, you still pick yourself a high key, key pro, uh, area at about 800 feet. You fly a proper downwind leg, a proper diagonal leg, proper base leg and come in and land. At all times, you can see where you're landing. If you're too close, as you go past the downwind leg, there comes a point where you cannot see um, the airfield. So if you're too close, you've actually got to turn through 180 degrees to be able to see where you're landing. Whereas if you come down a proper circuit, all the way down here, excuse me, sir. Daisy, shush. It's calling the cat, honestly, bloody children. Can't sell them, can you? Can't give them away. Um, so yeah, so if you fly a proper circuit at all times, you can see the airfield or the field that you're landing in, which is exactly why we, why we teach uh, a proper circuit, being the right sort of angle away from the airfield at all time. Um, it, gives you, it gives you a really good view of the airfield. And as Paul said, if you spot a slope, perhaps I, I'd been flying the other way and I cocked it up completely, I'd have spotted a slope uh, in, in North Wales, no problem. So if we do it like that, it's, am I, why is that not working? One, two, okay. Um, that, that gives us the best opportunity. So yeah, don't cramp yourself in, good speed control. You know, you, you're keeping an eye on things, keep an eye on your ASI, pick your speed for the day. I mean, theoretically, if you fly cross country, it's usually five, 10, 15 knots maximum if you're doing a lot of cross country, unless you're flying a, a hot ship like Mr. Chris Gill does with his DG, flying across country, you can, you know, fly on higher speeds than that. But generally when we're, particularly when you're first starting out, it's five, 10, 12 knots maximum. So you know, yeah, you know, you're going to have to have proper good speed control, select your speed and make sure you stick to it. If you're glancing by the ASI occasionally, do a final Peter turn. Sorry, Peter Andrew. Peter made a good point. Peter Gill's made a good point. Most beginners 
Twice yeah. circuits too close to the field. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Barney. I've just noticed Barney has mentioned that um, that uh, field landing should have been, my three words were, I wet myself. Uh, the reason being, uh, the story behind that was that uh, as I was coming to land, for some reason there was a blockage in my pee tube that was stuck to the end of my willy. And as I squeezed the bulbous amount of urine to push it into the bag, it exploded. So uh, I, I was covered in piddle, uh, hoping that I didn't crash on a landing because quite frankly, I wasn't quite sure how to, uh, how to explain that one. Um, but uh, I'm sure, I mean, I see Andy Kidd there, uh, Rich Mitchell, they both helped me out of that field, fair play to them, and they didn't make a word, but they were quite quick getting me out of the car. Though. <laughs> right. Um, so what do you do if it all goes wrong? If you've cocked it up, you've cocked it up. The, these things happen with flying gliders. They're quite expensive, but they're insured. So what do you do if it goes wrong? If you're about to hit an obstruction, if you encounter a wire fence, they don't do very well against wire fences and neither will you because they're only plastic. If you're landing in a tall crop, a few of these things. Uh, if you're landing on top of a rock pile, if you're landing on water. So if you're about to hit an obstruction and you can do nothing else about it, put your wing down and ground loop your glider. You're very unlikely, unless it's too fast, you're very unlikely to, to hurt yourself. You break the glider, but at least you'll have solved that, that problem. It's not ideal. It will come about with something you don't want, but generally if you've done everything that we've talked about or I've talked about, you won't have a, a problem. Uh, if you encounter a wire fence, same sort of thing. Don't go through it. Uh, it'll cut the plastic um, uh, canopy uh, and it will hurt you or decapitate you or whatever, so be careful. So better to ground loop than go through that. If you're landing in a tall crop, you're coming down to land in a tall crop and you realize that it's a tall crop at the last minute, I'll try and round out just above the crop and let yourself come down into it. What was that, Peter, you said? Someone said to hit a tree with a fuselage, head on, not with the wing. That was, uh, yeah, yeah, don't be alert. Peter, I get that uh, question, but that's even shook your hand before I do. Thanks, Rich. Um, yeah, that was, that was a reference a few weeks ago on uh, WhatsApp, wasn't it? About somebody coming into land um, and hitting uh, a tree on approach. Well, don't hit a tree on approach, um, for sure. <laughs> if, you're, if you hit it with a wing, it can spin you around. But, you know, just, just avoid it. I, I get what you're saying, but that's not to do with what, once you're landed. But I get what you're saying. So, and perhaps somebody else can make a comment on that in a minute. But yeah, it just don't hit a tree when you come into land. You know, leave yourself plenty of time, leave yourself plenty of height. Um, and I'll show you a few trees that were close to the landing that I did on the video. So if you're landing on a rock pile, um, and these are, this is all in the Bronze Sea um, book, so try and hit it sideways with the wing, but that's very unlikely. And if you're landing on water, don't. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of people have landed uh, in Finland on water because there's a lot of lakes up there and nobody, as far as I'm aware, has ever been killed doing it. They, they tend to land with the undercarriage down, they round out, they prepare themselves before they land, they open up and they get out. So not, not really a big issue and one I don't think we're gonna to need to worry about that. So what to do once you've landed? And this is, this is just basic housekeeping really. Secure the glider uh, and tell, tell us at the gliding club that you, you're okay and that you've landed. Uh, in the Bronze Sea, um, book it so it says let distress and diversion sell of gnats know you've landed on this telephone number i got to be honest i've never done that can i ask if any other mo any anybody else who's landed out uh, in the uh, on the thing here tonight has anybody else ever done that let gnats know if anybody can let me know on chat or something like that because I, i've never really i hadn't realized it myself until i read reread the uh, bronze sea again so not something i've done um I always find uh, being apologetic to the farmer, remember a smile goes a long way. It's true, I've never ever had a bad experience landing in a field with farmers. I've had quite a few good ones actually. Um, offer to pay for phone calls, if you use their phone, if they demand payment, don't dismiss it immediately. Explain that any damage will be covered by your insurance company. Uh, as it says here, the farmer is not entitled to detain your glider. If he does explain that he's responsible for the safekeeping of it. So if it's damaged, he pays. Uh, 
field online. Not like that, but I've corresponded with them at Visit the Cell. They do appreciate a call. Uh, we're currently updating club operating notes. This is from Paul Bitters. And an overdue action will be contact D&D. So this bit is important. Okay. Something I've never done, but for sure, yeah. Um, the, other, the other thing that I learned, the other thing that I learned, Graham, on a course I did with Chris down at Denby with G. Dale was, um, I've saved it in my phone, is, is the D&D &D, uh, phone number, that phone number, and also 121 decimal five, uh, also on the, on the VHF. Uh, we, we were trained at the time to, to let them know. Simply because it avoids um, wasted emergency call out. Yeah, time. no, for sure. And I think that's what happens what? Is that the public can report it as a crash. The public can report it as a crash and then it ends up calling the emergency services when you're absolutely fine. Yeah, I, I mean, I see a note on the, the group chat from Derek, Derek Heaton. Thanks, thanks, Derek. Uh, yes, when the police came to me. So, yeah, so the police did come and it, it can happen. People think that when we're landing in fields, it's a crash, which of course which of course it's not. So, and the last point there, above all though, remember that 99% of the time, the landing of a glider in a farmer's field is exciting for them. They enjoy it, but a lot of them, but yeah, there's one or two that don't. It's a chance to meet nice people, often respond generously with help, tea and cake. And I've had all of those. The last time I landed in, in, in North Wales, people couldn't have been more helpful to try and get me out of the field, to take me where I needed to go, uh, to ignore the smell of whittle, uh, all the usual stuff. Um, and remember to be thankful, always be prepared to thank, send them a thank you of, of some sort. So oh, you're think, probably thinking, thank God. I've got uh, a short video here of, uh, it's about four minutes long, but it, it's worth watching. It's um, a video I took when I landed out uh, about three or four years ago when I was first flying my PIC 20B. Um, for those of you who don't know what a PIC 20B is, it's a, it's a fiberglass 40 to 1 uh, glider that hasn't got any um, air brakes. It's just got a windy handle that you pull the flaps down on. So it, it, I hadn't flown it very much. It was a wave day when I decided to push off into wind to see if I could get into the next bar on a clear blue day and didn't find it. Um, so I'm gonna show you uh, this video, if I can work out how to get to it. It's about, I say it's four minutes long, I'll let it run. You'll, you'll see on the altimeter that I'm about I'm starting my sort of base leg at about 1,200 feet. It wasn't as high as that. I was actually, uh, I was actually flying Kieran H. Um, so I started probably about 800 feet, but it's a very windy day. I'd done the circuit. And I've only, I only cut the video from the base leg. And when I come in to land, you'll, you'll see me winding the handle and then diving towards the bloody trees at the end because I wound the handle the wrong way. I wasn't used to flying the sodding thing. Um, but in the end, I had plenty of speed and popped over the trees at the end. So hopefully, David Gill, I've been given beer. Well done. Well done, David. Um, I'll play this. And then, uh, and then when I get to the end, and then there's one more slide after this. So I'll let this play for about, it's about three and a half minutes long. And it gives everybody a, a view of what it's like to land in a field. Can you hear it? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pause it there for a second because it's this field I'm aiming at here. Normally, um, when I'm flying, I would be about two fields back, two average sort of side fields back, 
But on this one, because it was a windy day and I had plenty of height, I just put myself further back. So I flew a nice big wide circuit. So it, it just gave me plenty of opportunity to think and to, to line myself up. Like the windy handle. Okay, bear with me. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, yeah, so that that was not the best field landing in the world, but uh, walked away from it quite happily. Uh, really quite enjoyed it. If I'd only flown the glider a bit more before I'd got there, I'd have realised not to wind the handle in the wrong way uh, <laughs> and not going quite so close to the trees. But it was a nice slope, uh, landed up the slope, so it was good fun. Some other fields, or the, another field I landed in, in the same glider, not, not long after that. <laughs> I was getting used to landing it in fields at that point. It was a nice bean field, um, uh, not far away uh, from the airfield. Um, and I didn't land in these tracks that you can see on the, on the right hand picture, um, but I landed in the field, didn't create uh, a lot of, of hassle. Um, and if I just go back up again, we actually moved the glider out of the field along the track. So we did no damage to the, to the farmer's field at all. He was happy. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's really it's just that you know being considerate all the time so as I said there at the end of the day safe landing is what it's about good way to get to know your fellow glider pilots it's a good bit of fun and if you're lucky hey there's a few people that come and rescue you at the end of the day Mr Mr Donovan there Mr Bose Mr Frost Mike Webb's dragged me it was also there that day was also dragged me out of a few fields and Rich Mitchell and Andy Kidd and I'm sure there's others who've uh, pulled me out of fields but um that's uh, that's it, guys. So uh, hopefully that's been helpful, and uh, you know you can go ahead and enjoy um, flying cross country, not worrying about it too much until you have to, and then just having a plan, make a decision, and stick to it. Uh, okay. So if there's any questions, Mr. Frost, Neil Frost, there's rubbing his hands, ready to ask awkward questions by the look of it. <laughs> um, so if anybody wants to ask a question, thanks, John Mack. Uh, Peter Ptolemy, what's the biggest novice mistake one can make? What do people often misjudge? Um, I think the biggest thing, and I think Peter mentioned it earlier, if you get too close to your, your fields, um, you will lose sight of it. You know, have confidence in your glide angle, know what it is, know how far away you've got to be. Um, and that that's the biggest mistake people make and then not sticking to their decision. You know, if it's crap and you can't fly it, you know, soar away, have a nice safe field landing. Yeah, you might sit there for an hour or so, but so what? It's nice. It's, it's been a good, exciting adventure. Generally, you're not actually that far away from home because even though people set off on big, long cross countries, you tend to 
be okay for most of the day. It's it, unless you're pushing really hard. It's really when you get back towards the end of the day and you get near to home anyway. So, you know, that make a decision and stick with it. Any other questions? If anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, if they don't want to type it, then that's fine. I just asked a question there, Graham. The interesting thing for me from your video was how obviously your your altimeter is set to Q and H across country. So it's completely by eye, the height. You, you've got to completely ignore the altimeter, which as an ab initio like me, you naturally, and I know we're taught on circuits and we'll have you scramble the altimeter and get used to judging it by eye. But I think that's a quick, big lesson from that video is looking at how out, it was about 300 feet, your altimeter was set as you were landing, obviously, because it's set to Q and H. So that was an interesting yeah. lesson I mean, for me. I, I think you do, the more you fly, the better your eye gets. I mean, I flew out of Slape a few years ago and I set the altimeter at a thousand feet before I took off by mistake. I zeroed it in the wrong place. And I was getting quite low and I was thinking, it's still telling me I had however much height. Uh, and I was looking out the window thinking, that ain't right. So I went in and landed and I realized I'd set my altimeter wrong. So, you know, that's that's what it should do. You should should be using your your your, your eye out. Yeah, so Chris Gill, always have an information box on moving map, etc., showing height above ground. Yeah, Chris, I do that. I have to say on my UDI, I've got a, a box that always tells me uh, roughly, well, it tells me above what my height is above ground level. And I do use that, um, but I don't rely on it fully. Uh, Stephen Bailey, there is a lot of miscanthus around us at the moment. Is it easy to spot from the air? <laughs> I have no idea what miscanthus is, so if anybody can let me know. I just look out the window and aim for a brown one. <laughs> Bit of a metaphor for life, that really. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anybody? Can anybody elucidate on what miscanthus is, please? Is it pink, blue, or oh, hold on, uh, very tall, stiff grass? <laughs> oh dear, I don't know. Oh yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't want to land in tall, stiff grass. Um, crops always look even and velvety, including miscanthus, elephant grass. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Biomass. There's no need to get personal, John Mack. Uh, <laughs> Graham? Yeah? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'm typing out. I'm a bit of a technophobe, I think. I can't see how to send messages. Okay. I've been typing and nothing's been going. That's because you're completely... But all I'm, all I'm going to say is that the biggest problem is people cramping, followed by poor speed control. Yeah. Definitely. So yeah. I don't have to send it now because I, I don't know how to. Yeah, no, that's sound, mate, doing it that way. I think speed control, you must keep an eye on your ASI as you're coming around. That doesn't mean glue your eyes to it, but keep an eye on it. You know, if you're in a turn and your speed's low and you're not at the right height, you know, you're going to end up spinning the glider in and you don't want to do that. So, yeah, for sure, that's good. Cramping in and speed control, yeah, very good. Uh, okay. tip, look at out, look out the height of the crop on the way to the club. It will give a good in. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Mr. Witters has just said that it's it really is. Um... <laughs> Derek, look at the ciphered video to see different colour of short and longer grass. That's very true, actually. At the moment, where the sheep are munching the grass, it looks very more. It looks much more yellowy, and everywhere else, it looks a lot. It looks quite green. So yeah, for sure, I did see that earlier as I was looking at the sheep that had escaped. Okay, good. Uh, any other questions? No? Well, I think in the end, we had 29 people. I think that's absolutely brilliant, everybody. I really do. Um, I've managed to finish my beer. The kids have almost behaved. Uh, and Andrew's almost been useful. <laughs> so it thanks, is great. Graham. Yeah, no, that's, thanks. That's, thanks a lot, mate. No, thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for coming along. And, Have and a I'll shake. Do... Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah. Can I just can I just add a request in? Thank you so much to everyone. Mike Fox, uh, as I've coerced Mike Fox into doing next week's, which is at eight o'clock next Wednesday night. So we're hopefully aiming to do it roughly weekly, although not set in stone. Um, but I asked on the WhatsApp group, any Mike would like to know what are the popular topics. So any suggestions, guys, that you've got? If you're not on the WhatsApp group, then 
you can ask Graham's an admin. Um, and who's the other person an admin, Graham? But um, get on the WhatsApp and any suggestions of what you'd like Mike to talk about next week. And also, big request for any of the experienced pilots or instructors in the club, get in touch with me and let me know if you're willing and able to volunteer uh, to do a talk. It doesn't need to be training, as Graham's done tonight. It's a bit of fun, something to learn for everyone. You know, it's a social for us to get together in lockdown. But also, it's interesting, and we're going to all going to learn something from it as well. So, any volunteers, um, either instructors, or don't, you don't have to be an instructor, any of the uh, experienced club members who want to tell a story or talk about an expedition or a trip, etc. I'd be really grateful to hear from you. And just let me know. Drop me an email or a, or a message. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. It's lovely to see you. I can't wait to get back to the gliding club and start being a prat again. So... Uh... Oh, no, I don't need to get back there to do that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so Paul, Paul's just made a comment in the, in the really important, especially for me, because it's my bronze year this year. So really, I'm delighted Paul is setting up a bronze content sessions, hopefully starting this Friday, to any of even the experienced members who are all Silver Seas or whatever, it's not a bad idea to you know, revise, refresh, et cetera. I don't know whether Paul, more senior members are welcome, but certainly for the non-bronze members, get on the course with Paul. And I'm assuming, Paul, if you can nod and let me know, that's okay. The more experienced members, if you want a refresher, you know, refresh, et cetera, um, come and join Paul's bronze content sessions, et cetera. And a bit of training always helps us. And, and just because you're all really lucky, uh, because of the coronavirus situation, my, my company has asked me to work part-time, four days a week, so I might be there most Wednesdays. How lucky are you? <laughs> it was really hard to say, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks, and girls. Thank you Thanks. so much for coming. Um, we'll see you again next week. Thanks, and bye. 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 Cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers.